once upon a time, or rather, at the beginning of time itself. Before time existed as we know it, before the dawning of the world, we humans were there, say the Australian Aboriginal people, in the dream time. The ancestors, the first ones, made their way across a vast, murky, desolate plain that would one day become Earth as consciousness stirred quietly within them, glowing like a tiny spark trying to catch flame. They wandered and wandered through undifferentiated space, and everything flowed together in a strange way. But nonetheless, they began to live. They explored, built, fought, loved, but most importantly, they dreamed. Each night they would dream of the things they would see and do, and each following day those things came to be. It was not just a prophecy, but a sort of mass conjuration of the world through imagination. All of its wondrous landscapes, the mountains, the valleys, the rivers, the forests, and the plains, and everything that creeps and crawls and flies among them, and all the elements from which these were made, began as a dream. As these things were coming into being, out of this single collective force, distinctions between one thing and another remained fluid, much like what we experience in dreams, like how the human fetus in its early stage resembles all other animals. A plant could become an animal, an animal a landform, a landform a man or a woman. Back and forth, the transformations occurred as the adventures of dreamtime stories required, writes mythographer Robert Lawler. In this cosmic cauldron of imminence, the fantastical adventures, the impossible feats and discoveries of the first heroes we find in myths across the world actually occurred within the dreamtime. All cycles and stages of life occurring simultaneously. A primordial playground of potentialities in which a grand experiment was being conducted. As the dreaming unfolds, Lawler continues, the mighty acts of the great ancestors, their pains and joys, successes and failures, blindness and revelations, sculpt the earth these acts accumulate and are retained as memory, as a world-shaping code. When finally the ancestors grew weary, they descended into the earth to rest. And as the dust settled, these residual energies solidified into physical form condensing like vapor into droplets. The world is inherently imbued with spiritual power, and each part of it, down to the smallest pebble or a single blade of grass, holds significance that extends beyond space and time and back to the heart of creation. The interiority of the gods is our external reality, states Lawler. naturally the entire paradigm of the aborigines revolves around the central axis of the great dream. The pathways the ancestors traveled 
became especially charged with this primordial energy, along with the places where they stopped to camp, and they became known as places of power. These places sing the stories of their creation, and these songs are learned and performed daily as a means of bringing the people into alignment with the will of the ancestors and the gods, which are part and parcel of the earth itself. I can't think of a better myth to set the tone for this episode. To help us get into the same frame of mind as the ancients, who were evidently convinced that the earth was made up of more than dirt and rock and dead matter. Rather, the earth was made of and saturated with spirit, teeming with consciousness and itself conscious. So while the whole of the world was considered sacred, the conviction was nonetheless there that certain places on earth were particularly special, points where the divine first breaks through into the world, creating what we call sacred space. Esteemed anthropologist Mircea Eliade stated that this belief in sacred space, which has been shared by all cultures, quote, is not a matter of theoretical speculation but of primary religious experience that precedes all reflection on the world. In other words, this was something that they felt and experienced directly, perhaps long before there were words to describe it. David Abram in his book, The Spell of the Sensuous, postulates that before the invention of language, the natural world quite literally spoke to us, and communication was one and the same as perception. Our experience of nature gave rise to thought and ultimately to systems of language. In many traditions, it is said that language was first imparted through the songs of birds. It seems ancient humans may have had an entirely different system of perception and cognition, certainly a different experience of the world than anything we could imagine today. And so as difficult as it might be, that is precisely the task of our journey into sacred space, to see the world as they might have, and if we're lucky, maybe even rediscover the magic of the earth for it has much to give and teach those who have the eyes to truly see it, the ears to truly listen. The natural world is inseparable from the supernatural. Its surface is permeated with mysteries and perforated with openings to other realms. When we cross that threshold, we feel it. In a single step, we can travel unimaginable distances. Welcome to the Hidden Passage. To really understand sacred space, it's necessary to first establish the essential ontological difference between our physical plane of existence and what was believed to be the spiritual plane. One of the first existential epiphanies of early man 
was undoubtedly that our physical reality was impermanent, moving through cycles of creation and destruction, of life and death. It came to be regarded in early religious contemplations as essentially unreal, as chaos or illusion, sometimes referred to as Maya. But underlying this transience of earthly existence, there seemed to be an ordering force, a principle that continued to manifest itself each time in every new cycle. While all of the plants would seem to die in winter, they would come back to life and grow to their original forms. Everything would eventually return. Not only this, but it seemed to be moving toward growth on some mysterious path of evolutionary organization. The blueprint, or true essence, and driving force of creation, therefore, had to exist and had to have its origin somewhere else that was invisible to us. And if it was invisible, it was beyond this world. So it was reasoned that somewhere beyond this realm was an eternal realm, a place that did not suffer death, of which our world was merely a faint and fleeting reflection. This too was confirmed to them through religious ecstasy and experiences of revelation. Because of this perceived permanence and pervasiveness, both preceding, giving birth to, and proceeding beyond life as we know it, it was considered to be essentially more real, the true and preeminent reality. Sacred space in our physical world, therefore, notes Iliade, represents a superabundance of reality pouring over into our world. It is the liminal zone where the divine makes contact with the physical plane and two worlds meet, a paradoxical reconciliation of opposites. It was this interaction that made the world and life itself possible as spirit was believed to be the organizing, animating force of matter. We must not forget, writes Iliade, that for religious man, the supernatural is indissolubly connected with the natural, that nature always expresses something that transcends it. Each of the manifold forms to be found in nature are themselves representations unique modalities of particular spiritual forces, the physical expression of a non-physical force. And so every object is an object of intent. A stone is venerated not because it is a stone, it is venerated because it is a product of the gods, perhaps even a conscious spirit of its own. At any rate, its origin lies in the spiritual world, and therefore it is sacred. Through the experience and contemplation of nature, the nature of the divine could be apprehended. So even a stone was worth developing a spiritual connection to. By touching the cold, solid surface and sinking into its stillness, we can invoke divine qualities of stability and endurance, a state of eternal being that is beyond evolution. The gods kept an open dialogue with our ancestors through nature, in the sound of the wind rustling in the leaves or in the flight path of a bird straight and true through the clear morning air. Anything could be seen as code carrying information about the unseen worlds, or even as a direct message from the gods themselves. And this may not have been simply a subjective phenomenon that we could chalk up to cultural primitivism, reaching into the realm of parapsychology 
There's a more exotic theory in the theosophical traditions that say that there were actual physiological differences that allowed ancient humans to perceive reality on a different level, on a transcendent level. Esotericist Rudolf Steiner in his book Cosmic Memory writes, through the senses of hearing and touch, early man perceived deeper mysteries of nature, which they could interpret consciously. The laws and wisdom of nature were unveiled to them. They did not perceive sensory objects, but spiritual entities. The processes of nature did not appear to him as dependent on lifeless natural laws as they do the scientists of today, but rather as the actions of spiritual beings. External reality did not yet exist, for there were no external senses. So at any rate, we can say that before organized religion, and the construction of temples, in the pagan worldview, the distinction between sacred and profane was much less defined. By profane in this context, we mean worldly things that are not of spiritual origin. Some scholars even argue that in various cultures like the ancient Celtic people, there was essentially no distinction between the sacred and the profane. So as we said before, while all space is in some sense sacred, there are always some that hold primacy over others. All cultures recognize certain locations of supernatural potency from which spiritual forces first manifested into our world. This is referred to as hierophany. The space immediately surrounding hierophany is considered sacred. The original hierophany and center of earth formed what is commonly referred to in religious studies as the axis mundi. It had to be at the center because it was from this single point out of which the entire cosmos emanated, expanding outward in a circular field. In modern physics, we can perhaps draw a comparison to the center of the Big Bang, expanding outward to create the universe, which is thought to have an outer edge. The power of the sacred is world-creating, and it brings with it a universalizing force that unifies the interrelated components of the world. Its power is explosive in nature and expands outward from its center to the outer limit, writes religious scholar and author Walter L. Brenneman. Any hierophany in a sense formed its own cosmos, regardless of its size. The definition of cosmos implies an ordered whole contained and separated from the infinite. Existence as we understand it necessitates separation. In the esoteric traditions, it was taught that God separated his own universal essence to manifest the universe. Whether it was a physical or an invisible structure, or merely conceptual, the Axis Mundi was essentially the great link between the three main levels of the cosmos, the underworld, the earth, and the sky world, extending through all three and connecting them together. These connection points were doorways, which opened to the great passage between the worlds. The Axis Mundi was invariably envisioned as a pillar or a mountain or a vine. The imagery of the pillar is used because the Axis Mundi supports the entire cosmos and literally holds up the heavens. Its power is responsible for providing the essence to and holding together the entire cosmos, without which everything collapses 
back into chaos. The Celts and Germans constructed and venerated effigies of the cosmic pillar. It is reported in the Chronicum Lorisens in 800 AD that Charlemagne, in his war against the Saxons, destroyed a temple and the sacred wood, which Rudolf of Falfa explained was believed to be, quote, the pillar of the universe, which, as it were, supports all things. The Axis Mundi was commonly associated with the supposed highest point on Earth, so one of its most common forms was the World Mountain. Just some examples of the World Mountain are Mount Miru in India, Hara Berezaiti in Iran, the fabled Mount of the Lands in Mesopotamia, Gerizim in Palestine, and Mount Kailash in Tibet. Groups of people almost always sought to live and establish their settlements as close as possible to what they believed to be the Axis Mundi, or at least the central point of their chosen land. In observing this unusual behavior, Eliade gives to my mind a provocative and profound insight into the underlying motives behind the religious impulse of humanity. It is not, as we might think today, born from a desire to escape reality or to live in some kind of fantasy. Actually, he asserts the exact opposite. Quote, Religious man's desire to live in the sacred is in fact equivalent to his desire to take up abode in objective reality not let himself be paralyzed by the never-ceasing relativity of purely subjective experiences. To live in a real and effective world, and not in an illusion. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with it. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. The chaos outside of the cosmos, then, is really non-reality, which is impossible to comprehend, disorienting and inhospitable to humans. We can make another interesting comparison here to scientific ideas regarding what is beyond the edge of the universe, which really we have no ideas about. To even pose the question of whether or not there is anything outside, let alone what it is, is by many considered a moot point because science predicts that the existence of space and time itself begins to break down. The issue becomes non-propositional. There is no physical edge or outside it, yet we're still moving from order to chaos. So we acknowledge the cosmos and, in fact, that there is something beyond it, even if it is no thing. I don't know about you, but thinking about this makes me a little anxious, so let's go back to the center. The power of the center. I am at the center of the world, cries the quacky oodle neophyte during his initiation. In the high magic tradition of the Golden Dawn, during the foundational lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, the practitioner first begins the working by imagining themselves at the center of the universe, growing upward through the darkness as a tall giant, the earth shrinking beneath their feet. A luminous orb descends from the highest heaven above, from the farthest reaches of what can be imagined in space, and a column of white light descends 
shooting down through the center of the body, through the crown of the head, down the spine, and out the sacral, anchoring itself to the earth, the crown to the kingdom. Do you ever feel lost? Find your center and build your world around it. Many of the great holy hearts of civilization are or were located near geographical high points relative to their surroundings. It is said that Palestine was not submerged during the flood. We can make an interesting callback here to our study of Atlantis, which also was said to have a mountain in its center reaching the sphere of the ether. If indeed, as the Egyptian priest Sanchez stated, the survivors of the Great Flood were those that dwelled upon the mountains and high places, they would have expanded outward from those locations after the floodwaters receded. This may go towards explaining some of the mythical qualities of origination and heavenly grace associated with mountains. Now, speaking from a purely spiritual standpoint, the World Mountain became a central precept used by secret societies and their mystery traditions involving enlightenment and the great work. In an anonymous letter attributed to the Brothers of the Rose Cross, the mystical pilgrimage to the one true World Mountain is described in detail the characteristics of which are more akin to the shamanic journey that we saw in our shamanism episode. The section reads as follows. There is a mountain situated in the midst of the earth, or center of the world, which is both small and great. It is soft, also above all measure hard and stony, it is far off and near at hand, but by the providence of God, invisible. In it are hidden the most ample treasures, which the world is not able to value. This mountain, by the envy of the devil, who always opposeth the glory of God and the happiness of man, is compassed about with very cruel beasts and ravenous birds which make the way thither both difficult and dangerous, and therefore hitherto, because the time has not yet come, the way thither could not be sought after, nor found out. At last, the way is to be found by those who are worthy. But notwithstanding by every man's self-labor and endeavors, to this mountain you shall go, in a certain night when it comes, most long and most dark, and see that you prepare yourselves in prayer. Insist the way that leads to the mountain, but ask not of any man where the way lies. Only follow your guide, who will offer himself to you, and will meet you, but you shall not know him. Hearken to me, protector of mankind. I am ready and waiting. This guide will bring you to the mountain at midnight, when all things are silent and dark. It is necessary that you arm yourselves with resolute, heroic courage, lest you fear those things that will happen, and so fall back. You need no sword, only call upon God sincerely and heartily. When you have discovered the mountain, the first miracle that will appear is this, a most vehement and very great wind that will shake the mountain and shatter the rocks to pieces. You shall be encountered also by lions and dragons and other terrible beasts. But fear not any of these things. Be resolute and take heed that you return not. For your guide who brought you thither will not suffer any evil to befall you. you shall not pass! 
As for the treasure, it is not yet discovered, but it is very near. After this wind will come an earthquake that will overthrow those things which the wind hath left and make all flat. But be sure that you fall not off. The earthquake being passed, there shall follow a fire that will consume the earthly rubbish and discover the treasure. But as yet, you cannot see it. After all these things, and near the daybreak, there shall be a calm, and you shall see the day star arise, and the dawning will appear, and you shall perceive a great treasure. The chiefest thing in it, and the most perfect, is a certain exalted tincture, with which the world, if it served God and were worthy of such gifts, might be tinged and turn into most pure gold. Are you prepared to make this journey? To the Nordic peoples, the Axis Mundi was a tree. The tree Yggdrasil is a mighty ash tree, the most perfect and beautiful of all trees. Also the largest, writes author Neil Gaiman in his retelling of Norse mythology. It grows between the nine worlds and joins them, each to each. The tops of its branches are above the sky. It is so large that the roots of the ash are in three worlds, and it is fed by three wells. The first root and deepest goes into the underworld. Nilfheim, the place that existed before other places. In the center of this dark world there is an ever-churning spring, Vergelmir, so loud it sounds like a roaring kettle. The dragon Nidhogg lives in these waters, and it is always gnawing at the root from below. There is an eagle who waits at the highest branches of the world tree, and who knows many things. A squirrel, Ratatosk, lives in the branches. It takes gossip and messages from Nidhogg, the dread corpse eater, to the eagle and back again. The squirrel tells lies to both of them and takes joy in provoking anger. However much artistic license may have been used in this story, we can still get a sense of the core principles of the world axis serving as a connection between the realms and facilitating communication between them. As the great receiver of divine energies descending through this world axis into her being like seeds into the dirt, it is worth discussing beliefs regarding the earth itself, which was recognized as a divine being. In agrarian cultures, she became especially beloved. The physical world was thought to be the body of this deity. For instance, the Ganges River, referred to as the soul of India, is itself considered a physical expression of the goddess. Mahadevi is all of the matter in the entire universe. Parts of the universe are identified with her body, writes Eleanor W. Gaddon. The earth, her loins, the oceans, her bowels, the mountains, her bones the trees, her hair, the rivers, her veins. The sun and moon are her eyes. The cosmos was often conceived as layers upon layers of beings whose contributions of essence fashions the world. In the cosmogonies of many disparate cultures, we also find the myth of the cosmic giant 
out of whose dead body the world is formed. The Chinese giant Pangu, the first being to be conceived in the primordial cosmic egg, separated yin from yang with his axe, creating the earth and the heavens. My legend has ended. When he eventually died, his breath became the air, his voice the thunder, his eyes the sun and moon, his head the mountains, his blood water, his flesh the land, his beard became the stars, his hair the trees, his bones the minerals and ores, and the animals of the earth were like fleas living on his skin. The mystery traditions taught that in the course of spiritual evolution, that human beings progressed to the likeness of planets, and eventually each one became an entire cosmos themselves, which were the physical expressions or the remnants left by their higher forms, their consciousness now existed in the non-physical realm. So the earth represented an advanced, ascended being. Pythagoras too saw the entire cosmos as a living body, with each place being a functioning part of this greater whole. Therefore, the whole life of the cosmos relied on these interconnections of all its parts, with the health of one part affecting the others, adds Plutarch. Just as the body has different organs and systems within itself that serve certain functions, so too did each area of the cosmos and the earth. For example, we can imagine the rivers, the oceans, and precipitation cycles circulating the water, the life force or the blood of the earth, through the body of the land and nourishing it. So the landscape was spiritually dynamic, with each area having its own unique metaphysical property that could be understood by observing its physical structures of correspondence. And now we come to the earth herself. It was she who provided the foundations of life, the vessel for the physical expression of spirit. Her realm was the ultimate chamber of the mysteries through which all who have ever lived or will ever live pass as part of a great channel of energy flowing perpetually into and out of materiality. Nature contains nature, mused the ancient philosophers. Nature rejoices in her own nature. Nature surmounts nature. Nature cannot be amended but in her own nature. She herself holds the keys to the mysteries of life, death, conception, and regeneration, as the egg chooses which sperm will be the one to fertilize to become alive, as environmental and biological factors determine life with all its possibilities and its limitations. Occult author and lecturer Manly Hall writes of the earth goddess Isis. This deity under many names is the principle of natural fecundity among nearly all the religions of the ancient world. She was known as the goddess with 10,000 appellations and was metamorphosed by Christianity into the Virgin Mary. For Isis, although she gave birth to all living things, still remained a virgin. The earth is pregnant with spirit, contended the ancients, linked to the spiritual worlds as the child is connected to the mother through the umbilical cord, nourished by it, the daughter of heaven and the mother of man. This conception is why many sacred spaces came to be referred to as the navel of the world. 
the mother archetype of the earth is beautifully expressed in the Native American cosmogenic myth that the first humans lived underground in the dark recesses of the subterranean earth, existing in a kind of embryonic state where they would ripen to maturity before eventually climbing up to the surface. This mystical conviction of the earth as the mother of humanity can also be seen across Europe with folktales regarding caves or brooks that bring forth children, such as the Kinderbrunnen. Caves were commonly seen as the womb. Writer and environmentalist James A. Swan suggests that the cave art of Paleolithic cultures was actually part of a magical operation based on this belief. Quote, Symbolically, what is placed within, whether it be an enactment of hunting, a call for healing, the transformative ritual of initiation, or the burial of a dead relative, will come to birth or rebirth in the outer world. This earth principle of generation extends cyclically to beliefs regarding the inevitable reabsorption or reintegration back into that same power. It is expressed in the practice of burial, which is derived from ancient magico-religious traditions stemming from a deep sense of belonging to the land. In this process, the dichotomy of the earth is expressed. Not only does it hold power to coalesce forms, but it also has the power to disperse them. The Homeric hymns declare firm earth, eldest of gods, that nourishes all things in the world. Thine it is to give life or to take life from mortal men. This power is keenly represented in water, one of the five elements, which according to spiritual science are all contained within the earth element. To the alchemists, the spiritual power of water was demonstrated on the physical level through its function as the universal solvent. This title was given to water by Isaac Newton, who was actually himself an alchemist praising its ability to dissolve and purify more substances than any other. The only surviving formula for the Philosopher's Stone begins solely with water, collected from the morning dew at midsummer. These beliefs regarding the metaphysical properties of water are expressed in the baptism ritual. By means of immersion into water, the initiate is symbolically returned to, quote, the undifferentiated mode of preexistence, states Eliade, of which water, being without fixed form, is a symbol. The ritual of mock burials, as we have seen among the Druids, also serves this same purpose. By temporarily returning to the earth, the spiritual rebirth can take place. It was through the earth which the divine manifested, therefore through its agency was to be found the way back to it. So these two properties of earth kind of parlay into the different qualities of sacred space which we're going to talk about. And what we begin to see is that not all sacred space shares the same qualities. In highlighting these two primary polar principles of emergence and immersion, we can identify two main types respectively, one having an expanding or pushing outward quality, and another which draws inward. Professor of Religious Studies Walter L. Brenneman, in his experience traveling to the holy wells and springs in Ireland, feels that the latter principle is emphasized by the Celtic traditions the feminine pull, if you will, which he describes as loric power. This is expressed in the many myths and legends of people being taken to the otherworld, 
through earthly and watery passages, such as lakes, oceans, rivers, and wells. The structurally hollow burial mounds were also gateways to the other world, yonic symbols of the earth. All of the ideas we have explored so far were so important to the ancients that they heavily influenced human life from that of the individual to the formation and activities of entire nations. It was incumbent upon them to chart and utilize these sacred spaces on earth. Revelation of sacred space, writes Eliade, makes it possible to obtain a fixed point and hence to acquire orientation in the chaos of homogeneity to quote found the world and to live in a real sense so the principles of sacred space profoundly fuse together psychology with geography as we have stated, wherever a hierophany occurred, it became the center of a cosmos, which meant order, continuity, and contact with the divine. All things that made a space habitable for man, and this happened on all levels, from the microcosm to the macrocosm. So in order to harness this power, it was imperative to locate and consecrate the center of an area, be it that of a city, the larger continent, or the world itself. For instance, Temple Mount, Jerusalem, and Israel are all considered to be at their respective centers. Even at the level of the individual family, the home itself was essentially its own cosmos. As we saw in the Christmas episode, the hearth and the chimney represented the Axis Mundi. It was the central gathering place for the family that would emanate warmth into the whole home, the microcosmos. All of this considered, Eliade makes the following statement. It seems an inescapable conclusion that religious man sought to live as near as possible to the center of the world. In other words, the man of traditional societies could only live in a space opening upward, where the break in plane was symbolically assured, and hence communication with the transcendental world was ritually possible. So within each settlement, the central hierophany was established to cosmicize the territory. It was now an autonomous, real entity defined by its borders, which separated it from the surrounding homogeneity of space in the same manner as God parting the waters to form the world. Order was formed from chaos. The cosmogenic act had to be recapitulated to invoke divine power and create a legitimate society, allowing its people to enjoy a sense of having the blessing of the gods, without which there was no peace of mind. God forbid that the gods become angry or disenchanted with their creation. We all know what happens then. By extension, the enemies or outsiders of an established state may become personifications of the archetypal enemies of deity, the demonic agents of chaos. One can see how this belief could be beneficial to unite people under a common cause, but could also be used to encourage despotism and warmongering and things of that nature when taken to the extreme. 
Nordic, Greek, Celtic, and even Nazi traditions reveal a worldwide geomantic obsession with finding the exact center of the homeland, writes Hugh Newman, author of the book Earth Grids. The center was seen as the birthplace of the tribe, from which the king could survey his domain and give laws from his sacred rock. Even in nomadic cultures such as the Arunta Australian Aborigines, establishing the cosmic center was extremely important. These people quite deftly solved the issue of not having a fixed location by fashioning a portable sacred pole which was carried with them at all times from place to place. It was reported by an anthropologist that once when the pole was broken that the tribe wandered around aimlessly in confusion and anguish before finally laying down and waiting for death to take them. In the famed 40 years of wandering in the desert, the ancient Israelites carried with them the Ark of the Covenant and set up a makeshift tabernacle in every place they stopped. This was essentially their way of establishing a central axis through which they could communicate with Yahweh. It was said that he would manifest himself by day as a pillar of cloud that flashed like a thunderstorm, and by night a pillar of fire. Look, up in the sky! Ah. By following these pillars, they were guided through the vast wilderness to the promised land. We must proceed with caution. The established center of a people became glorified with the construction of the temple, which was often built on or near the central axis. If this natural center did not exist or could not be found, the temple was in lieu of this. The connecting link to the heavens in this case was constructed by man. It was the Imago Mundi, the representation of the central axis. Here we see the aspect of sacred space as the dwelling place of the deity on earth emphasized. The mysteries of the Near East spoke of three temples of Solomon. The name Solomon standing for the three principles of the divine, Sol, O, Man, light, glory, and truth. The first was the cosmic temple, the sun, which existed at the center of the cosmos. The second temple was the human body, the little house made in the image of the great house. The third was the solar house, S-O-U-L-A-R, which was invisible and was one of the supreme mysteries of the Arcanum. The location of this temple and its meaning was only disclosed to the highest initiates of the order. The power of Hierophany manifesting in the land was like a magnet drawing people towards it, a mysterious invisible force giving rise to whole societies. Consequently, a deep connection between a people and their local environment certainly existed. This is represented quintessentially in pre-Christian Ireland, whose geological landscape actually prescribed the political landscape. This was geopolitics in the truest sense. The people inhabiting the Emerald Isle in antiquity formed small, independent communities called Tuaths. The primary factor that called forth and unified the tribe was actually to be found in the features of the land itself. 
For example, everyone living in a certain valley would constitute a single unified tribe. Where the valley ended marked the border of the territory. The word Tuath translates to both dwelling land and the people who dwell there. It was not simply the existence of a natural border, but a shared sense of belonging to the land that would bind together many individuals into the Tuath. They were unified spiritually as much as they were geographically. Endemic was the belief that people came from the land on which they dwelt and were attached to it, as the child is to the mother. Thus, migrations seldom occurred, and warfare actually did not result in the taking of another's territory, because within this paradigm it simply wasn't possible to hold or use the land to which one did not belong. This belonging was consecrated and formalized by the ritual marriage of the chieftain to the local spirit of the land as we alluded to in the fairy episodes. You may kiss the bride. Huh? <laughs> Archaeologist and author Miranda Aldhouse Green states that Celtic myths, quote, contain a prominent perception that the king's power rested with the goddess of sovereignty the personification of the land itself, and that only by her acceptance of him and her marriage to him could he rule successfully. As long as the king upheld his commitment and was generous in his offerings, the Tuath would enjoy her patronage. If he did not, the goddess would withdraw her support until a new chieftain was installed. At the center of each Tuath was the mound, which was often enclosed by an earthen or stone wall called the Ring Fort. The mounds were mostly natural hills, upon some of which were built passage tombs or enclosures. It was here that the religious ceremonies and political assemblages of the tribe were conducted. At this point, we've spent a considerable amount of time exploring concepts of the central axes and the general idea of sacred space. But what was it specifically about these spaces that so obsessed the ancients? Like we said at the very beginning, these ideas did not come from philosophical speculations. They came from direct, powerful experiences that clearly had a huge effect on human life. Why else would people have gone through all the trouble of finding and shaping their societies around these centers of power? How else could such elaborate and frankly strange ideas arise within human consciousness that were so firmly believed to be true? In the next episode, we're going to explore these supernatural qualities of sacred space, their ability to give profound visions and communications with spirits and gods, to miraculously heal and even to transport people to other realms and allow strange, otherworldly beings to enter ours. <laughs>